Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Shea Anything Podcast. With Doug Williams and Keith Hernandez with you. Uh, soon we will be joined by Daryl Strawberry. We're very excited about that. He'll join us in just a couple minutes. Before we get to Daryl, um, we have a couple reactions we want to revisit from the booth this past week, Keith. The first is, I believe, a description of a curveball and a phrasing that I had not heard before, and I'm anxious to hear your description of it on the other side. Okay. Well, this young man, Ronnie, is impressive yeah, so he, far. He is. I know we're only in the second inning, the beginning of it, but he's not afraid, and he's coming after the hitters. Now we'll see how he does after sitting in the dugout for a long time during a 35-pitch inning by Waka. He misses with a curve. Oh, you don't get that strike. Mark. My goodness. He's got a good curve. A good snappy Tom. <laughs> oh, snappy Tom. <laughs> What's the backstory? It, it, is that an actual phrase, or, or is that just something that uh, you refer to a curveball as? You're too young to, to, to know. You weren't even a rouse. Snappy Tom used to be a product, a canned product that was, I think, for a Bloody Mary. And it, it was a, it was a, the logo was a chili pepper, a red chili pepper with a sombrero. And it was a, it was a Snappy Tom. So I, I, I always call a guy with a good curveball, that's a, a, a Snappy Tom. Because Tom Seaver had a snappy Tom. And you know what? You got a lot of flack for not knowing what a PB&J was, but yes. you know what, uh, you know, the, the chili pepper wearing a sombrero in an old school. Uh... <laughs> um, all right. The next one reaction revisited our last one before we get to Daryl. It's just a story about uh, an umpire. I, I think this was from the minor leagues. Take a listen. There was a lot of umpires in my day when I uh, played in the minor leagues, double A and triple A, that you can smell a little bit of bourbon on them. <laughs> well, those guys, I mean, you talked about unhappiness. I'm sure the triple A umpires, especially in those days, those guys didn't get to be vacation replacements at the big league level. And so they had to be resentful, too, that they hadn't gotten the call. <laughs> I got thrown out of a game and. Uh, uh, El Paso, the umpire was was smoked. He called a pitch three feet outside, and, I, <laughs> and he was reeking of. He was an older guy, and um, I said, "You're drunk." He was so, I got in his face, and it was just like, "Whoa!" <laughs> All the great stories in the minor leagues. How did he react to being called drunk? Uh, well, he it was an old. A lot of old umpires that never made it, and they were in Double A, and. Uh, Double A was the, probably the one league that had the most for the old umpires that had been around or lifers. And uh, I got thrown out of that game. I bumped him. And because I was just, I was 19 and I was just stunned and naive that there would be an umpire that uh, I could smell the bourbon on him uh, five feet away. And uh, the pitch was three, five, five feet outside. And he got close to me and I bumped him and Tom Burgess, my manager came out and, you know, separate, he bumped me back. And then Bobby Bragan, the old manager for the, for the Milwaukee Braves back in the Hetty Matthews and Johnny Sane and Warren Spahn days, Hank Aaron. Uh, he was the president of the Texas league and I got fined a hundred dollars and I was making in double a seven fifty a month. And uh, I was probably clearing a little over maybe 250 every two weeks, maybe five. Maybe I was clearing 500 a month, maybe less. And uh, I couldn't afford a hundred dollar fine. It was, and I, my, my parents taught me there was no computers back then. You had to do your own bank book, right? You had to do your own long math arithmetic. And I screwed up and I sent Bobby Reagan the hundred dollar check and it bounced. Mm. <laughs> so only check of my life I bounced and I bounced it to the president of the league. And as it turned out later, uh, Carl Sawatsky, former Cardinal was the general manager of the little rock Cardinals. And he came in and laughed and he said, Bragan just had the biggest laugh and realized. So, I mean, I, so I wrote another check. Uh, immediately, and that one didn't bounce. And I wasn't All suspended. I wasn't suspended for that. You know, probably because they knew because they're young players. They want the players to play. They're developing. And the, and umpire, maybe... the umpire was was hammered. He was he was hammered. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, maybe they, maybe they, maybe they knew his reputation. I was about to say the only thing that sounds worse than being underpaid to play baseball in El Paso is being an, a longtime umpire for minor league baseball in El Paso. And man, oh, um, well, my- that Texas league was the travel league. It was you had two; those umpires had that made no money. You had to get in their own cars. Uh, you had El Paso, Midland, Odessa, Amarillo. Uh, in San Antonio and the Western Division. In the Eastern Division, gosh, you had Little Rock, Memphis, Alexandria, Louisiana. Holy cow, what a town that was. Ugh. And then Shreveport, which was a real rough town. Uh, it was just uh, the biggest travel league. Uh, it was 18 hours from Little Rock to El Paso, 16 hours to Modesto, uh, to Midland, 12 hours to Amarillo, and uh, I think it was 14 hours to San Antonio. And I on bus. Greyhound bus. And I swore I'd, if I had to go back in that league again, I'm going to go find a regular job like everybody else. Mm, that just sounds sweaty listening to it. Um, all right. This is pretty awesome. We get to welcome Daryl Strawberry to the podcast with Keith. And I, basically the goal of the next however many minutes we talk is for me to talk as little as possible. I want to hear you guys uh, talk about what it was like to play together, be teammates, and um, maybe ask each other questions if anything occurs to you. Uh, Daryl, first of all, how are you doing? Where are you joining us from? I am joining you guys from South Carolina. I'm speaking at a conference here at, uh, around um, 3 o'clock p.m. So um, I just got off a flight and flew in from St. Louis, and I'm here. I'm here with you guys. All right, good. We're glad to hear you. Uh, we were talking to you before. You're staying safe and everything. And um, the last that I spoke to you was – uh, in the middle of this break from baseball, you had just done or were just preparing to do the uh, Game 6 1986 watch party, which obviously both of you uh, were part of. Um, what, looking back on that, Daryl, was that more fun than you thought it was going to be? Was that uh, was there a more of a, a big group of teammates than you thought maybe would show up for that? It was a thrill. I mean, it actually really was it, you know, reminisce uh, with the guys that we all played with. And we had a fun group. I, I love that group of guys. I mean, it was, it was an animal house team and um, we had a heart uh, of winning. We, our heart and soul was just different than, you know, anything else. And I think that's why we went on to achieve what we did. I, you know, I think he could tell you that, you know, when we, when we came into spring training that year, it was just something about us that was different. And we just wanted to win and at any cost. And I just, I mean, I'm just grateful for all those guys. You know, you look at all of them that we play with. Uh, they're phenomenal guys, you know, and we just, we just had a lot of fun playing and we had a lot of fun winning that year. Keith, what did you right? think of the, the watch party? Yeah. And do no, you agree was, with everything Daryl just said? <laughs> we uh, hadn't seen each other in a long time. Everybody's scattered around the world, you know, the Western hemisphere and, and, um, it was great to have everybody on and be able to chat like we were after a game meeting at the hotel bar and talking about all of our at bats that night. You know, it was, it felt, had that kind of a feel as if we were playing, um, you know, and also in addition to what Daryl said about coming into spring training, we had law won 98 games and went home the year before. And we, and Cardinals won 102 and, we were bound and determined to change that. And we knew the Cardinals were going to be our mark. And then Davey came out, our manager, and said that we're going to dominate in spring training. You remember that, Daryl? And I about fell off my locker chair when a writer came up to me and said, Davey says you guys are going to dominate. And I go, oh, did he? <laughs> so, okay, I guess we better. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I said, it was you know when you see when you see guys you played with and you had great success with. Um, I mean, for so many years, you know, not and building up into that '86 year, um, we just kind of just dominated that part. But I, I think a couple of years before that, you know, we we really established ourselves as we were going to be winners one day. And of course, we wish we'd have won more, no question about it. But I, I just like seeing the guys and, and just, just thinking about the conversations uh, of some of the guys that they had, you know, Bobby O of course was leading them talking about him pitching, you know, and, and <laughs> him dealing. <laughs> and that's a, that's a, that's a great character. I love Bobby O because I, 
I always thought Bobby O was one of those pitchers that we could have used in any situation, any big game. Because uh, you think about the 86 team, you know, and, and Doc struggled a little bit during that series. And, and then you, you had other pitchers come in and, and do a great job. And you had Kid Carter, you know, who, who played big. Lenny played big. You know, it's just so many guys played big roles, you know, for, for that team. Uh, it, it was just not about one player. It was just about all of us. And that team will go down in history as my favorite team. You know, I always get questions about who the better team, the 98 Yankees or the 86 Mets. I go, the 86 Mets, you know, of course, we, we, we were different, Keith. We had just real swag about ourselves. We, we had a different personality. Speaking of Bobby O, uh, if I can use the phrase ball busting, trash talk, whatever you want to call it, from the Facebook Live, when you're not part of a group and you watch that, you're like, wow, these guys are going after each other. And Bobby O was leading the parade. And then, so tell me about the dynamic there, Daryl. Is it just um, friendly, like I said, ball busting with somebody like Bobby O and the character that he is? What, what is that just the way it was back then, the way it is today? He's the same person. You know, he hasn't changed. He was that way back when we were uh, – uh, considered just the scum bunch, you know, and he was part of the scum bunch in the back of the plane and, 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 and the personality of what he, what he was busting, you know, busting balls is, is real. You know, that was the same way on the back of the plane. I mean, some things, some things just hasn't changed, you know, and it's just the way it is, you know, I mean, you don't take it personal. I mean, if you get personal about that, uh, you, you just don't have a, a great sense of humor. You know, I, I think we were, like I said, we were a group of brothers together in in that year. And, man, that was fun. I mean, it, it keeps, you could talk. Man, come on, man. You know that was fun when, what we went yes, through it was. that year. I, I never experienced it. Go ahead. You win 108 games. That's fun. Yeah. I, I that's mean, not, I never That's not losing a lot. I, I just think that we got together again. It was like we were in the locker room again. We needled each other all the time. And it was everybody. No one was above it. And we even got on opponents in end game. So we were, we were a tough bunch. We, we, we pissed off a lot of pitchers because we'd wolf and holler at, we'd wolf and holler at them in the dugout. You know, if they were a five and fly, boy, did we get on their butt. And, uh, but we got on each other and it was just part of the camaraderie of our group. You know, I, we were tight. Daryl, what was your first impression of Keith as a teammate? Oh my God! I mean, I mean, Keith was Keith, Keith, Keith and Donnie baseball are probably the two best first basemen I ever seen that played the game the way they played the game. Uh, just two different style of players, uh, but at the same time, uh, just great players. You know, I, I'm surprised. You know that these guys are not sitting in the Hall of Fame. You know, with so many other just mediocre players. You know, I've never seen. You know, a guy play with so much intensity uh, as Keith had played with and, and what he brought to the ballpark and what he brought to that ball club. I mean, it was special. You, We were young, so, you know, young players had a lot to learn. You don't realize it until after years are over how good your teammates really are, you know. And I, I always admired Keith because, you know, he helped me so much and he helped me learn how to hit left-handed pitching. And, and he, was just a, he was just a phenomenal student of what the game was really all about. I mean, his first base play was just like off the charts, man. That's, him and Donnie Mattingly, the, the, their, first, their, their first base play is just like way off the charts. So different than any first baseman I've ever seen. And so many di- probably so many different than any first baseman that ever, ever really played the game the way their style was. It, two different styles, but, you know, the same kind of, you know, same kind of players over there. Um, the movement, you know, uh, Keith was just such a, uh, a phenomenal clutch hitter. I don't know my, how many hits he got in big games, and then you know, see him on first base. He was crazy too. He was crazy as <laughs> he was crazy as ever when you see him on base. He's, he was one of the crazy, intense players I ever played with. I remember I hit that home run in the playoff off of Nepper, you know, and I think I came in and he just grabbed me by the shirt and he just threw me all over the place, you know. And say, <laughs> I you remember know? that. <laughs> well, that was that was such a big hit. We were losing. Yeah, we're that, down four to was, one. That was that hit. That home run gets lost because uh, yeah. of Lenny's home run that won the game off of uh, Dave Smith and, uh, you know, the 16-inning game. But 
every game we were down and your home run off of Ryan gets lost. We yeah. lose that game one nothing. If you don't hit yeah. that home run, Ryan was dealing. So you hit he two was. big home runs that get overlooked. Yeah, but you know, I the as far as as far as you know you and the way you were, you were always, I mean, that fiery player, you know, that 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 great leadership, you know, you and Carter and, and, and Ray Knight brought so much stability to to that team uh, more than anything. I think people don't want to recognize that. But, you know, after your career is over and you recognize and you sit back and you reflect on it, uh, you realize how good these guys were. I mean, these guys were great, man. Carter was great. Hernandez was great. Ray Knight was great for us. You know, had we not had them, we wouldn't be the 86 champs, you know, because they kind of – guided us you know coming i remember when keith came over in 83 and he was like man new york this is terrible here you know with the match you know <laughs> i was thinking he's out of here you know and and keith said you know we went through that that little strike in um, time and his dad told him you know i think you i think you should stick stick around they look like right. we have some pretty talented players i remember you saying that yep he saw keith. you play he saw you play and he saw doc <laughs> on TV or they're doing the minor league broadcast on, on ESPN. And he just said, that's, there's two guys down there that are a foundation for your team. I think that you might want to stay. So yeah, no doubt. He was right. Keith, Keith um, same question to you about Daryl, your first impressions of him as, as a teammate. Uh, my first impressions was I remember as a kid, coming up and I didn't know at that point how good Daryl was going to be. I knew that the sky was the limit. Um, but he reminded me when I was a kid, when Willie McCovey came up with the giants and Willie McCovey played left field because they had Orlando Cepeda at first base and they wound up trading Cepeda because McCovey was a, well, not a good outfielder. He did, and they moved him to first base, but McCovey was tall and slender like Daryl. And then McCovey, you know, came into be as he got immature, he just big, strong, six foot four monster. And Daryl became that too. So Daryl reminded me a lot of um, uh, Willie McCovey. Everybody said that Daryl reminded him of Ted Williams. I said, no, no, this is Willie. This is the second coming of Willie McCovey. And uh, it, it certainly was. And um, to watch Daryl's progress, you know, it's fun. Even in the booth now, there are certain players that come up that get you watch them, you see them in their rookie year, and you see them advance, become star players. It's fun to watch that. Well, I got to be on the field with Daryl and watch him day in, day out, get better and better and better and really live up to his, uh, you know, what he was supposed to be. Everybody said he was going to be. And that's a lot of pressure that was put on Daryl, uh, particularly in New York. Uh, it's a lot more magnified. And then Daryl persevered and became, I mean, he had some home runs that I, I can't, I mean, uh, that popcorn stand in, in Houston, the dome, that what third deck or fourth deck. I think he, that, that popcorn stand, I think you broke it. I couldn't, be, I couldn't <laughs> believe that home run. The one you hit in Montreal. Okay, great. But that one you hit in the dome, I could not believe it. We're on the third base dugout. So I'm watching the ball go, and I'd never seen anybody hit one there. And there was nobody up there. It was all empty. It was just all by itself. <laughs> I'll, never, I'll never forget that home run. And then, of course, the one off the clock in St. Louis. The one off the clock off Ken Daly in St. Louis. Yeah. The, the 88 home run in Montreal, our producer Jeff, who's on this Zoom call with us, was there somehow. Keith, I mean, you just tossed that one aside because there are so many to recall. What do you remember about that home run, though? I don't remember much of it. I just remember, what, did it go out of the stadium? Hit the roof. Right, right hit the roof. Um, I had a bad angle because we were third base, Doug. And you hit, where'd you hit it, down the right field or left field line? Right field. I, I, I just don't have a remembrance of that. But I will never – that was the longest home run I ever saw Daryl hit in the dome. That was I, – I just couldn't believe it. And if Daryl had a maple bat like they have today, that thing might have gone up in the upper tank. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, but uh, that and the, of course the big hit off Daly in St. Louis and off the clock 
in uh, up the scoreboard in right center field. Be- I remember that one because number one, it was a bomb and it was the big, big hit that won the game. The first game, right? First game in the series. And um, I remember how there was a full house in St. Louis, in the Bush Stadium. And you could have heard, when they hit the clock, you could have heard a pin drop. The people were just like, oh, my God, I don't believe what I just saw. And we were the same way in the dugout. Uh, I, I just couldn't believe it. But we were euphoric because it gave us the lead. And we had to win that first game. We had to. We had Tudor yeah. against Darling. And Darling matched goose eggs with Tudor. And, uh, you know, Ron pitched probably the clutchest game of his life right there. And uh, it was just a huge win. Um, it was. Daryl keeps talking about obviously how he watched your career evolve and you're obviously not the first or the last to talk about Keith's leadership on, on those Mets teams. Um, how did that evolve and how did your relationship evolve as you got to know Keith more and as you continued to play together? Well, I, I think as you understood, as you understood as a young player, you watch a guy and you watch how steady and consistent he is. And that's what the big leagues is all about. Uh, it's not about a one or two year and done. And you see so many players uh, come in with so much hype and, and one or two years are done. But Keith had already done this in St. Louis before he got here. I didn't know who he was and until, until he actually um, got over here with the Mets and then going to St. Louis and realizing how big of a deal he was, you know, there with the Cardinals and, and, you know, you look at his history over there. I mean, guy just flat out, flat out raked. You know, I just have to call it what it is, you know. And the big leagues is about being consistent and, and developing into the kind of player that you believe you are, you know. And you don't see you don't see that a lot, like, uh, going forward. But you used to see that back in the days of, of guys having great years. And Keith was one of those guys, you know. I think he was like, was you co-MVP in 79, something like that, in one of those years? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, 79. 79, I remember with, being was, on the call. With, with Stargell. Yeah, that's pretty popular there, man, you know, being yeah. co-MVP. You know, I got robbed of the MVP. So, was, you know, he was co-MVP with Stargell. And, and, and that's, pretty, that's pretty awesome to see his career and understand who he really was, you know, after going back to St. Louis. It, I didn't realize how big of a deal he was when he came over. They was like, when, when he was coming over the Nets, they were like, we're getting Hernandez. And I didn't know him because I hadn't been in the big leagues long enough to know, uh, know who he was. But everybody else did, all the other players in, in the city of New York did. And, you know, what a guy to come to New York City and, you know, and just have such a, I mean, just a dog fiery personality about winning. And uh, that's what made us great, man. I, I just... You know, when you have great leadership, you know, I, I wasn't that guy. I was young, you know, and Carter and Keith and, like I said, Night War, they had great experience and great leadership that they brought to a younger group of guys. Because we had a young young group of guys that were just very talented but never had leadership skills. And I think that's what made the difference in us being so successful in, in those runs that we were having all those years is because – of a guy like Hernandez, you know, he was, he was day in and day out. You, you, you knew what you was getting. Okay. All right. He's not taking infield. So why worry about it? He didn't have to take the infield because he was so good at first base. You know, he wasn't like a mediocre first baseman. Then once you started understanding why he didn't take infield and you see him play first base, you was like, well, he doesn't need to take infield. All the rest of us probably need to be out there taking infield, you know, and people would say, well, Keith is not taking infield. David would be like, so don't worry about Keith. Keith he's, <laughs> he knows what he's doing. I, I, I got my ground balls. And, I got my ground balls in BP, and you know, Whitey had a rule where you had to take infield, and I never liked. Uh, we were always on, on the road. You'd take the infield the last. The home team would take it first at the seven thirty games. Then so seven o'clock, the home team takes infield. Then seven o five, the visiting team, and it'd be over at ten after. And I'd never felt I was twenty minutes for the game. It was too rushed. I just liked that 30 minutes of just getting in the clubhouse, you know, smoking a heater and just relaxing and uh, getting ready for the game. And I asked Davey when I came over, and after um, in 84 when he started, I said, Davey, can I just not take it? But I don't need it. I, I do my 15 minutes uh, during BP, and I catch all my ground, all my throws from my infielders. I don't need to take it. 
And Davey said, yeah, you don't have to take infield. But remember, in the, we went in the playoffs, <laughs> Daryl, uh, Ray got up in front of the whole team in the clubhouse and said, now, Keith, God damn it, uh, we're in the playoffs now. You're going to take infield with us. And I said, okay, I'll take infield. I took infield the whole postseason. <laughs> but only Ray, Daryl's talking about the guys that had the, the leadership qualities. I know Ray some A ball. I yeah. played Ray, I remember Florida you know, State Ray. League. And, in, and then when he was with Indianapolis with the Reds in AAA, and I was in Tulsa. So I'd known Ray since I was 18 years old. And um, I wasn't going to get in a fight with Ray, that's for sure. So, Ray, you want me to take infield? I'll take infield. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. I, I think that was just the you know, real personality of our, our whole team and, and the characters that we did have. And, and we had some strong personalities. And Ray was a strong personality. Ray was good for us. Good for us, you know. You know, good to keep us calm. The good to keep us, you know, steady. You know, I remember I hit the home run in the in, in the World Series, and the first thing he grabbed me, and he goes, "You go over there and you shake Davey's hand, and you apologize to him, and you make up." And I was like, "All right, Ray, I will. I'll do it." You know, it's like everybody always asked me what was he saying. He was like, "Shake the manager's hand, and you guys need to make up. We don't need to have this." You broke up. Who did he want you to say you're sorry to? You broke uh, up, David. Game seven. Oh, oh, you wanted Remember to hit Davey? Yeah, I want to hit the home run, game seven. That's what he was talking oh, to me at. How about that, you know? <laughs> That's yes, exactly sir. what he was saying. That's exactly what he said. You go shake the manager's hand, and you apologize to him, and you guys need to just make up. How and I was like, good. okay. Very <laughs> nice. That Very was, nice. it was. Daryl's, of course, talking about getting taken out of game six coming back to hit the home run in game seven. And Keith, it's so interesting because Daryl's talking about how you were solidified in the league when you came over, obviously, coming after 79. You had had a lot of success. But we were talking last week about Pete Alonzo. He's uh, in year two of his big league career. And you were saying, I just, I, 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 I wouldn't have looked at that as like, I'm a solidified star in the big leagues. When you got to the Mets, obviously you were unsure about the team, the city, whether you were going to call it home and whether you wanted to. But what was your attitude like? Were you ready to go into a clubhouse and be that leadership guy? Was that how you were thinking? Or were you just going to be yourself and that was enough? I was just going to, to be myself. I didn't do anything different. Uh, I know that Frank Cashin came up to me in 84 in spring training and said, would you be willing – to take all the pressure away from the players and be the kind of the spokesman with the media after games and before. And I said, sure, I'll do that. That's why they kind of, they kind of flocked to me. And, um, you know, that got me in and out of trouble a little bit. Uh, there's some things I wish I hadn't said and, and then there's some things I'm glad I said, but, uh, I think all in all, uh, it was positive because the Mets were always paranoid about the media, uh, because it was a young team and they had uh, media training. They had, uh, I remember, I, was it a, some gal came in and <laughs> was coaching the players how to handle the media. And I'm just sitting over there going, that never happened in St. Louis, but St. Louis only had two papers and uh, covering the team. So, uh, so I, I did that. Uh, I didn't do anything differently. I, I just, I was in spring training after the first, 10 days, two weeks, and I saw all the young talent and I saw all the enthusiasm. And that whole core group was in their early 20s. And I was 30 years old, I believe. And it just really was a shot in the arm for me. It just uh, motivated me and uh, enthused me. And uh, plus, I came in the best shape of my life. I had run all winter for the first time in my career. Uh, and I came in in great shape. I remember one time we were running sprints. Daryl, remember this at Miller Huggins. I'm sure you will. We were running sprints, and Daryl can, you know, I mean, come on, Daryl can beat me running backwards. And uh, he was huffing and puffing, and I'm going, "Come on, man, what's wrong with you? I'm 30 years old. What are you, 21? What are you breathing so heavy for?" So that was the kind of things that started, and then uh, I think the big thing was getting us together after games and becoming a unit, meeting and talking about the at-bats. You know, I remember one time Hubie Brooks, and we love Hubie, 84. We saw we lost him, but he had to go uh, for us to get Carter. I mean, Hubie, Hubie hit a home run one game at Shea Stadium on a slider down and away, 
And, you know, Hubie would stick his butt out. He put one hand and he hit a line drive down the right field line. <laughs> and he came in the, the, the dugout. And I sat down next time. I said, Hubie, what'd you hit? And he goes, I don't know. And I said, you don't know? He goes, no, I don't know what I hit. I go, well, I'll tell you. You hit a slider on the outside corner knee high. How'd you do it? I don't know. Hubie. <laughs> 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 I miss Hubie. It's too bad he couldn't have been a part of our group. But, you know, we Carter was the final piece. So much um, of what you guys are talking about, uh, policing is the wrong word, but it's there's so much leadership in the clubhouse. Uh, the relationships were such a big part of it. Um, Daryl, what's your favorite? Is there a story or a memory of Davey Johnson as the manager? Uh, and generally, just how do you think he should be viewed as kind of the steward of that of that team? Well, I, I think Davey should be viewed as as great, awesome, um, just amazing, uh, because he he really allowed us to be players more than anything. Um, he wasn't a, he wasn't a patrol around the clubhouse. He just kind of let us go and let us do our own thing and let us have fun. And I, I just think one thing that he always got his point across to us was uh, playing the game the right way and playing hard. Um, and I think that's what we did. I think that's what came out of us. And, and I think when he saw that, when he saw us started to make that run um, from, you know, after 84, 85, you know, we were right there. And then 86 and 87, you know, we, we, we had better teams, you know, uh, after after the 86 year, uh, we just had a lot of injuries. And I think that's what really cost us more than anything. You know, pitching staff and guys getting hurt. And and we should, of course, wish we would have had one more because we had so much fun. But Davey Johnson was uh, a manager of fun. Um, he didn't – I mean, he, he didn't have any major rules set, you know, and maybe should have had some set on me because I know I was a little troubling at times. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I needed – I needed that. Um, I needed guys to get, you know, get on me at times. And, you know, and I was, I was grateful for the fact that, you know, guys would pull me, you know, to the side because a lot, you know, a, a lot of the players, uh, the older players helped the younger players develop into who we were. I mean, had it not been for Hernandez and Carter, um, Doc Gooden wouldn't have been as good as he was. They kept him, Keith kept him calm and Carter, they kept him calm on the mound and, and um, also myself, I mean, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have turned out to be the player I was had it not been for Davey and had it not been for the older players, the seniors on the team, um, showing us really what it was like to play at the major league level. Um, you can come in, you can have one good year. That, that, that doesn't mean you're going to – that doesn't mean it's going to click every year if, if you don't have a group of guys around you uh, that's going to push you and make you not – you know, get that big head. Well, you know, cause after one season and that's what I loved about Davey. That's what I loved about our uh, veteran players. You know, they didn't let you live on that last year. Okay. This is a new year. Uh, how are you going to, how are you going to get after it? How are you going to work? You know, and Davey was the same way. He was the same way because I think what happened with Davey was he was just like us because he played and he was successful playing. And he understood that it wasn't going to be easy, you know, going into the next year. You're going to live off the last year that you played. And, and we didn't live off the last year. We came in every year. We wanted to get better. And I think that's what was so great about Davey and, and the rest of the guys. Keith, do you have any reaction to that? Um, Davey just always said, show up on time, play hard, and don't embarrass the organization. And I'll stay out of your way. You know, he got a lot of criticism over the years about not having more control over our group. And, uh, you know, I played uh, nine years in St. Louis and we basically did the same thing as a team there. It was no different. We would meet and had drink beers. I mean, we got a bunch of guys in their twenties and thirties on the road and uh, you're all hyped up after a game and you're not going to go back to your hotel room. So it was, it was like a, a college fraternity. So, I always get a little rankled when they say that we were uh, a, a really wild, wild bunch. But, uh, you know, I think you got young, you got young men running around playing ball. It's still like it's extension of college. So, but everybody came to the park ready to play. 
and that was all that Davey wanted. And um, he was he, great to play for. He learned from the school of Earl Weaver, and he played for Earl Weaver on those Orioles teams. And it was a different generation. You know, things are much more tight now and not as loose and not as fun more, more structure i don't know i can't i can't speak to that because i don't know uh but we didn't have to worry about going out and have someone you know doing a you know a secret cell phone and doing a video with us and after we've had a couple uh, a couple pops you know and uh, we didn't have to worry about those kind of things and yeah. you know, today they make so much money they're targets so they got to be careful i mean holy cow you got i mean well, yeah, I, you were, go ahead daryl I, I, you know, from watching from from afar, uh, it, it it looks so different. It, you know, as far as the teams that I see playing, they don't they don't seem together like we were. They don't they like we did. You know, and and you know, we would call each other out. You know, and whatever it it took to win. You know, and I think I don't I don't see a lot of that in, in players today. I see like a lot of guys who want to you know they want their stats, they want their numbers, but. You can get the stats and numbers, but if you, if you don't have that real, real team um, togetherness, uh, you, you're not going to win. And that's I think that's what I loved about our years of playing. We we had that every year we came in to the season. The expectations were high, and we wanted to win. I think the expectations are high for the Mets in New York every year, but I, I don't I don't see a I don't see a toughness. I don't see like like we were. You know, we had like we had. Wally and we had dude, we had Lenny, you know, we had some personalities, some different swaggers in that way uh, that brought something totally different to the table, but we needed them to play like they did because they would set the table for us in the middle of the lineup and always be on base and, and bring opportunities. And I don't see a lot of that. I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of guys who are, who are tough mentally. I don't see a lot of guys that know how to drive runners in, you know, in situations. I see them leaving too many guys on base and stuff like that. And we had a group of guys that knew how to do that, that knew how to drive runners in, that, and, and guys at the top of the order used to know how to set the table for us. And, I mean, it would, it, I mean you, you'd be chopping on deck because you know that you got a first to third. I got to get that run in. I know, I know how to get that run in. And I don't, I don't see a lot of that. I see, I see today is, yeah, we, we, they make a lot of money. They're, they're, they hit the ball out of the ballpark. But do they actually hit them out of the ballpark when they count when you're driving in big runs and, and big situations? So I don't see a whole lot of that going on in the game today. Yeah, yeah, I, will, I, I will say, sorry, Doug, in defense of the players today, also, too, they don't allow them, the league now, they don't allow them to take out runners at, on a double play at second base. They don't allow them to knock down a catcher. They don't allow them. To, it, they've, they've, the, the lords of baseball have softened the game. And, uh, and I think much to the detriment of the game. So, I mean, what happened to Posey in San Francisco, number one, A, the base runner was ran inside the line when he didn't have to, slid inside. He, he could have gone out uh, in foul territory and been, and been safe, but he went after Posey, and it was a perfect storm. He caught him at the right time, and then you got a big money player that's a star, and boom, you can't take out catchers anymore. Then you got Utley, who's a smart player, doesn't know how to slide, and goes in and takes out a cross body block uh, on uh, Ruben Tejada, and all of a sudden, boom! You can't take out guys at second base in the double play anymore. And it's just right. to me that has softened the game, and uh, and it hasn't been good for the game. Well, he was on the back too, you know, when he took him out of the shortstop. I would have killed him too because I tried to kill out. Yeah, but he went times. and he, he he cross body blocked him. Was, I know, was, I know they probably, like you said, he didn't know how to slide. But it was a terrible saying, slide. <laughs> <laughs> just, you can't even yeah, call it a was. slide. It was a terrible you slide. Even... But, you know, that was the same thing, Keith, when we were, like, playing the Cardinals. And, and you go in there and you try to take Ozzie Smith out, and, and he just jumps over you and right. and looks at you and throw your finger like, yeah. not today, you know. I mean, at least you at least he knew we were coming in there to break up a double play. And, you know, you're right about that. Um the game is different when you can't. I mean, because if you think of a catcher, I mean, I remember Sosa one time was blocking the plate. Oh, yeah. And I, I ran him over. You know, you, uh, Mac Reynolds ran him over. Remember that time? At well, Jack LA? Clark knocked him out. <laughs> Jack Clark knocked him out at home plate when he was with the Cardinals. He gave him a forearm shiver. <laughs> that was vicious. <laughs> yeah, well, to what you guys are describing, and it's also the, the clubhouse thing, I mean – I'm an outsider, obviously, but it does seem like there's a lot of uh, avoidance of confrontation these days. You guys certainly didn't do that, but you were better for it. 
Um, and I, I love hearing the stories of what it was like to play together then. And um, you guys uh, being so candid with, with me and with our listeners. Um, Daryl, well, we were talking before the show and before we let you go, um, you've been doing your homework. You've been watching the Mets because you knew this podcast was coming. So we got to reward your hard work. What, what do you think of the team lately? Well, it's, it's going to be hard at the pace that they're going. And I, I think um, confidence is, is the real key to who you are, um, especially for them, you know, going through uh, baseball, what they've been through, going through this pandemic and everything. And uh, in the short season, if you if you don't have the confidence and believe in yourself and, and know your ability to play the game, um, you're going to suffer. You know, you, you're going to struggle. I mean, a couple months, you, you could struggle a couple months, you know, but you got to be, able to, uh, uh, I mean, at the beginning of the month, but you got to be able to get to a place where you got to start knowing who you are as the player, you know, and I think a lot of the players are not that comfortable. I don't see them. I don't see them very comfortable at what they're doing uh, as, as a team. I, I think they're looking at, you know, themselves as maybe the individually player, you know, as a stat, you know, as, as their stats and stuff like that, you know, are they going to come? They're not going to have stats this year. You know, you just might as well forget that, throw that out the window and you just need to apply yourself as an individual player to be able to play as well as you can and do some of the things uh, that made you successful um, the year before, you know, and I watched Pete, I watched him a couple of times and I watched his struggle and I, I, that people would ask me, well, what did you think? I think, well, he needs to work hitting the ball the other way. He was very successful um, last year hitting the ball the other way. If you hit the ball the other way, that's going to keep him standing on the baseball and not worrying about hitting the ball at the ballpark. You got, you got power. Uh, just allow yourself to use your power to all fields. And, and, and I think that's one thing that I, was a learning lesson for me when I was coming up is when I was struggling is learn to go to batting practice and learn to work the other way. I mean, Keith really taught me that. Um, hit, learn to hit the ball with the shortstop, shortstop head and hit the ball the other way. And it, and it keeps you on the baseball. So I, I think some of the guys that they have there are, are struggling because they're, they're looking and they're pressing and it's a short – short season for them and then they don't think they can they can put up big numbers it's not about putting up big numbers at this point it's about being consistent as a player and i think when they get back to that hopefully hopefully they get on the right track well daryl um this has been great such a treat for us thank you so much for joining us um and uh we appreciate a couple minutes of your time we're really longer than that this has been awesome thanks again hope to talk to you soon see you daryl all right right, keith Thanks for listening, everybody. Once again, we are the Shea Anything Podcast coming at you Mondays and Thursdays for the rest of the 2020 baseball season. If you haven't subscribed, rated, or reviewed us just yet, we appreciate all three equally wherever you find your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever. Uh, We appreciate listening, everybody. We will talk to you on Monday.